Good evening. You've just tuned into A Godly Woman's View with Pastor Anita Spaulding. And this is a great day. Uh, yesterday was the um, Memorial Day. And I just want to say, and I did already put something in for our, um, our veterans on yesterday. And just said to them, you know, that we were glad that they, uh, for their service and what they have done. And you know, oh my goodness, I'm bringing on our guests. Just give me a minute, you guys. Okay, it says I can't bring on. Why not? Okay, let's try this again because she's here. It's not letting me bring her on. Okay, there's already a guest in this broadcast. I don't know who the guest is. Hi. Hi. How you doing, Rebecca? I'm good. How are you? And as we're certainly glad that you joined us. Listen, you guys, our guest is on from Tennessee. She's in the house. So we're going to be speaking to her in a few minutes, okay? But you've just look, um, tuned into A Godly Woman's View with Anita C. Spaulding. And I am excited, as always, to be able to um, bring the show to you on your iPhones, your Androids, your iPad, your, your phone, because I call my phone. It's not an iPhone. It's my phone. All right, if I spend that much money on it, that's my fault. But anyway, um, this is a great um, show. This is our virtual talk show in which we've been coming on for a few years on social network. But um, tonight we're going to be talking about a, a special subject, and we have our guest who is going to be able to um, talk to us about it, and you can ask questions. What I want you to do, guys, is share, all right, because we're going to be talking about the power of forgiveness, the power of forgiveness. Now, I see all you guys are starting to sign on. I see um, Kimberly Worsley, Matthew Dennis, Lisa Shorter. How you doing, Mother Hayes? Oh, my goodness, you guys. If you need to roll around again and say hi, it's okay, because you know I like to recognize y'all. Hi, Khadija, my, old, my goddaughter. Oh, my goodness. Just give me some thumbs up or some hearts when you hear something good. But if you have some questions or some comments to make, please type them in. And if I can read that fast, I will, and I will try to um, uh, uh, answer them or the guests. Richard Spaulding is watching, my husband. So what we're going to do now, we're waiting on some more to come on, but we want you to share because we're going to be talking about um, betrayal, murder, lying, um, uh, 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 bombings, killings. So, and we're going to be talking about the first family. We have a PK kid here, and this is the pastor's daughter. But I just want to read a little bit about you to introduce her to you. I mean, Rebecca, we did this tonight. We got right on, right? Yes, no problems. <laughs> okay. All right, guys, just listen. How you doing, Richard Spaulding? He says, join the audience. It's going to be a great show. Um, Nancy Hayes says, good evening. Rebecca Nichols Alonzo is a speaker about betrayal and the power of forgiveness. Her story has been featured on Dr. Phil, The 700 Club, Lifestyle Magazine, and CNN. She has been involved in ministry, including church plants, youth outreach, Bible studies, and missions for over 20 years. Rebecca's autobiography, I'm not even saying it right, but anyway, bio, um, it, she's the author of The Devil in Pew Number 7, and it's an amazing true saga of relentless persecution, one's family faith and courage in the face of it, and a daughter whose parents taught her that forgiveness is the language of heaven. She attended Evangel University and is a graduate of Missouri State University. Rebecca and her husband, along with their two children, live in Tennessee. So let's just welcome um, Rebecca by um, putting the thumbs up, hit the little thumbs, or put, push the hearts, guys. Let her know you're welcoming her to the show. All right, I tell you, you got some, oh, this is a great audience tonight, and I know more are, um, are interested in talking about or hearing your story. And I met you because right after you were on Dr. Phil, I reached out to you. I was a wreck, and I said, that lady ain't coming on my show. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I, I was on Blog Talk Radio then, and, and I emailed you, and you said, certainly I will. I said, oh, oh, okay, all right. So the ball started rolling, but over the years, um, Rebecca, I've thought about you, and then the Lord dropped you in my spirit on the other day because I wanted to do something. So just say hello to the audience. And Hi, everyone. You. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Pastor Anita, for the opportunity to share again. I love you, and I know you have some great uh, people that follow your broadcast and your teachings and your encouragement. You are such an encourager. I see you on Facebook just really trying to lift everyone up with an encouraging word. Uh, with a, a message. And so I just appreciate all that you do in your ministry and um, reaching people for Jesus. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Listen, I see my, um, my, my sister and loved one, Loretta A. Spaulding, Sheila Jackson. I mean, you guys are so supportive on every week. Oh my goodness. I thank God for you, but we're going to um, go right into the questions that we have for, and listen, we want you to come on, tag somebody, share this, because this is a story that when I heard it, I said, oh my God, this is unbelievable. But she's an author, as I was saying, of the book, book which is her autobiography, of The Devil in Pew Number 7. The Devil in Pew Number 7. All right? So we, we want to start the show um, by asking uh, Rebecca to just um, tell us a little bit about herself. Now, you were a pastor's um, child, right? That's right. That's right. And I, I just want to say real quick that because of the way I have my phone turned landscape, I can't see the comments. And well, I don't. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. I, okay. I just didn't want anybody to think I wasn't like responding to their question or anything. So. No. Okay. 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 Yes. So my mom and dad uh, were evangelists and they were asked to do a revival in North Carolina in 1969. And they went there and the church did not have a pastor. So they loved my parents and asked them to stay on as the pastors of the church. And the following spring, I was born. So I was wow. born into this small farming community, small church, um, you know, just loved, called everybody aunt and uncle as I grew up. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it, and it was really neat because um, there were about 12 people when my mom and dad got to this little church. And, and right. like I said, it was in a small farming community, uh, cornfields and to, oh, uh, wow. tobacco fields everywhere. It and it was the country. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so um, it, it grew from about 12 people to over 100 within a year. Wow, wow. And it was, you know, wooden pews with the center aisle, you know, with the remembrance table for communion and the pulpit, you know, and, and so it was a traditional little church. And um, my mom was a, a, a musician and she could play pretty much any instrument you put in her hands. And so she played the organ wow. every Sunday. And uh, and put together a little singing group called the Spiritual Layers. And what's funny is they actually came to Nashville and recorded a record called I'm okay. Free. Yeah, the name of the, the record was called I'm Free. So okay. that's, yeah, so that's really neat. So the church just grew and, and, and I, you know, was just spoiled with love and uh, too much attention as PKs get, you know, you can't get yes, away with anything. Um, a lot of abuse, rebuke and everything. <laughs> Listen, um, somebody's saying hello to you. I think her name is uh, Reba. Uh, Reba Wilson Gerthry. Yes. Hi, Reba. Love you. <laughs> yeah, she, she loves you. Rebecca Nichols Alonzo. She said it's an amazing book. All right. She says that you have an amazing book. I see my son, Evan Spaulding, is on. Pastor Retta Fair. Oh, my goodness. Just so many great people are here watching. So you were a PK kid, and you were everybody was involved. Your, your mother, she was a musician, and you had singers. And Did you sing or something? Um, no, she taught me how to play the drums. And so uh, it was kind of funny as a little girl uh, in a long dress to the floor. Now, you, you try sitting on a drum stool, and I've got my strawberry shortcake dress on that, like, goes to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you couldn't wear pants either? No, no pants. Oh, yeah, I remember them days. <laughs> <laughs> she, 
she grew up so strict. Uh, her yes, family, Lord. yeah, from Louisiana. She actually lived across the street from the church. So my mom growing up would go across the street to the church and her dad was the worship leader. Oh, goodness. Uh huh. And so she, um, she was just such a sweet woman and, and grew up just really strict and, um, and, uh, was very much a disciplinarian. Like, so when I got in trouble, I got in trouble. Like, so you describe your childhood as a strict childhood. Uh, with my mother, my dad was more forgiving and merciful, <laughs> so I would usually try to run to him. <laughs> Go to the pastor. Go to the pastor on you. <laughs> for the mercy. <laughs> Listen, yeah. we're talking to um, Rebecca Alonzo. I mean, Rebecca Nichols Alonzo, and she is a PK kid, and she's the author of a fine book called "The Devil in Pew Number Seven. and she's also married to what's his name. Kenny Alonzo. Oh, Kenny Alonzo. That's, mm -hmm. oh, that sounds like he's a celebrity. Okay, <laughs> Kenny Alonzo. Well, we're so grateful to be able to um, have your family and just you yourself to come and share um, globally with us what is going on in your life. And I know many um, are going through some things right now, and they're in the state of unforgiveness. And that's a bad and pitiful state to be in. Can you just describe to us, what is forgiveness? Um, well, forgiveness is forgiving people even before they ask for forgiveness. Wow. Forgiveness is also given before an apology is given. Mm, you know, some, true. some people will not forgive unless the person that hurt them says they're sorry. And that's, I can't find that anywhere in the Bible. If anybody can find that, you just let me know where it is because <laughs> I can't find it. But we're supposed to forgive each other as Christ forgave us. Right, and but it doesn't mean that I have to come and sit and eat dinner with you, right? Or that's right, that's right, I'm especially. With you. <laughs> that's right. Well, and I have to say that everywhere I go and speak uh, is yeah. that if someone has hurt you, and, and it's not safe to be around that person or they've abused you or, you know, in any kind of way, like major abuse, you know, first of all, get counseling. Second of all, you can forgive them and, and at a distance, you don't have to forgive them. And, you know, sometimes we do forgive and God restores us to that person and it's safe and it's good. But if that person has not repented and come to the Lord and they're still an abuser, then that's when you can say, God, give me the grace to forgive. I forgive them, but I'm not going to put myself in a situation to be abused and to continue to be a victim because that's not what the kingdom of God is about. It's about being victorious Exactly. And overcoming and, mm -hmm. and the father loves his children and wants them to be cared for and cherished and safe. Wow, that is true. God bless you, Barbara Johnson. Good evening to you too, also, evangelist Pamela McKinley. How you doing? Listen, we're speaking to those of you that just signed on. We're speaking to a beautiful um icon, a beautiful woman of God uh, by the name of Rebecca Nichols Alonzo, and she's here to share with us and to even to um, help us in the area of forgiveness, or we could say unforgiveness, because some haven't forgiven. You say, well, I just can't forgive that person. But I want to just back um, track a little bit, uh, um, Rebecca, and ask you this. Um, as a child, what was the most frightening thing that you experienced in your life? Um, Right. Well, it, at first, this little church that my parents began to pastor, everything was wonderful. But about a year and a half into it, we had a man that sat in pew number seven. That's why the book is called The Devil in Pew Number Seven. And he began to threaten our family. And so with those threats came threatening uh, letters in the mail. And we lived in a little community called Sellerstown. And one of the letters read, you will leave Sellerstown walking, crawling, dead or alive. Wow. Was this during the revival? After the, revival. after the revival, once my parents accepted uh, pastorship there, that's about a year and a half into it. This man, Mr. Watts, who had run the church business, but my dad came in and said, if you're not a member, you can't vote anymore. And so my dad came in and stood up to this man who was, who was controlling the church, who was controlling the community. And so as a little girl, I was very safe and loved in my home, but we never knew 
who was sneaking around in our yard at night because this man, Mr. Watts, would hire people to sneak into our yard, slash our tires, cut our phone lines, and then they would um, do drive-by shootings. So when you talk about fear. Now, so how old were you? So the, the drive-by shooting started when I was four. Oh, you were four. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, is that um, how long did your father pastor that particular congregation? Um, he was pastor of that church for eight years. Okay, and eight so years. this happened about four years in with the drive-by shootings. And so he... Right. Mm -hmm. what? Um, I just want to say hello to a couple of people because yeah. I love to just, just reach out to them and touch and feel because I believe that people should be, feel a part of yeah. what they're involved in. And you took time, guys, to come on to support us. And some of the names have already strolled, so I haven't seen them. Mother Gordon, God bless you, Pastor Gordon, and so many of you. And you know I will respond to you after the show. But if you have a question, just put the question. I'll try to read it. Or help us build the audience by um, tagging somebody, putting your comments, putting your thumbs up or your hearts, and saying, I'm with you. I love this show. So, um, so what do you know what made him come to the point in his life, the guy on the uh, number seven seat, the pew number seven, what made him not like your dad? Well, you like, I, mm -hmm. so when my dad came in, Mr. Watts, this man that was ruling and reigning in the church and the community had never really had anyone stand up to him. He was a county commissioner. He was oh. a multimillionaire. And, right. and so, he, <laughs> so he would hire people to do his dirty work. And so when my dad came into this church and stood up to him and said, you can't be it, you can't vote on church business anymore if you're not a member. And he wasn't a member. And then his wife was the church secretary and Mr. Watts would write, he would write a check for the offering and take the cash and get the tax deduction. So my dad just found out about some things that he was doing that were, that were wrong. Was he a deacon? Was he he was, a deacon? No, he was not a deacon. He just was a member and he had money. He was not a member. He was oh. an, he was an attendee. <laughs> he was just a faithful every Sunday morning, pew number seven attendee. And like I said, he had had community control and church control for years. And so when my dad came in, see, my dad was ex Navy. He was almost six, four. So he was oh, not, <laughs> he was not scared of Mr. Watts, this man that was trying to control our family and terrorize us out of town is what he was trying to do was terrorize us and make us leave town. And my dad said, no, God called me to this church and I'm not going to leave until he tells me to leave. Wow. Now, um, the thing is, you said they, they came by and they would do drive by shootings. Yes. They were really trying to terrorize you guys and, and make you go. That's you right. Know, That's you right. Know, Eddie, the devil. The devil is a liar. God bless you, Dr. Jameson. Listen, so I like to, how did you adapt to living in fear? Because that's what it sounds like, like to me, that you were living in fear as a child. Well, it would, he would space out his attacks. So we would have like three to maybe six months of peace and quiet, and then he would strike again. And so when the threatening letters, the, the harassing phone calls, 30 to 60 a day, Okay, 30 to 60 phone calls a day, mainly at night. Um, this was before caller ID. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then, and then the drive-by shootings. And when the drive-by shootings didn't scare my parents out of town, then he hired these guys to sneak into our yard at night and, and, and put dynamite sticks around corn stalks that were behind our right. house. And then they would run a long fuse out to a side road, light the fuse, and, and a bomb would go off around our house and our church. And then that's when the FBI were called in because these were dynamite explosions. Right. So that's terrorist threats. That's right. That's right. He was determined to run us um, out of town. He did not like. And what's crazy is during all this terrorism, um, and, and as a little girl being taught to get on my knees at night, my mom and dad would kneel mm -hmm. next to me by my bed at night and pray. We prayed for Mr. Watts. We prayed for this man who was terrorizing our family. Did for anybody him. else say anything in the church to him well, at all? Well, see, he had been ruling and reigning in that community for over 30 years. And if you mess with Mr. Watts, you lost your land or you've turned up dead. 
Okay. So right. people, people were concerned, you know, that right. if they up stood the up to him and that's what made my dad somewhat of a hero in this community is because he finally stood up to Mr. Watts, but it was such a precious price to pay because this went on for five years. So, you know, during the day, everything was fine, but it was at night when it got dark and people were sneaking into our yard and slashing our tires and cutting our phone line and making us hostages in our own home because the neighbor was down the street. It, they weren't right next door. So we were really held hostage in our house a lot of nights when they would when they would slash our tires and cut our phone lines like that. Um, and and then and then sometimes on a Wednesday night during church service because we went to church Sunday morning Sunday night and Wednesday night. Monday through Sunday, <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> and then we traveled. We traveled on the weekends with my mom's singing group that she put together from the church. So we were busy, busy. Um, but on Wednesday nights or Sunday nights, uh, sometimes those bombs would go off during church. So you're sitting there, you're listening. Everything is quiet. And all of a sudden, a bomb would go off that could be heard miles down the street. And so everyone knew who was behind it. They yes. knew who he was, but they couldn't do anything about it. They, they wouldn't because they were afraid of their own um, safety. That's Listen, right. Um, Richard Spohn said five years of harassment because it does um, uh, call, that is harassment. But you as, as a child or growing up, you were, um, how did you deal with things uh, mentally and emotionally, because you could be emotional wreck. Or oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I watched my mom and dad like kids do, you know, yeah. kids are sponges and they're listening when you think they're not listening. And so I watched my mom and dad pray and forgive mm -hmm. and love anyway. And so that was my example. See, is that they the just done in the house. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord and the law. That's... Okay, which which one do you want? The law or you want the Lord? <laughs> yeah. Well, my dad, my dad could have seriously walked. Okay, so this was not just that he he was in Pew 7 every Sunday. Mr. Watts lived across the street from our house. Oh, Lord, have mercy. So imagine someone who hates you enough to shoot at a parsonage, okay, to shoot at a <laughs> pastor's home. And then my brother was born five years after me. So my okay. mother had my little brother Daniel and and one night she put him down to sleep in her bedroom and I went to bed which was right next to that bedroom and then she and my dad were in the kitchen and one of the worst dynamite bombings went off by that end of the house and blew out three windows while my baby brother was asleep in that room and mm -hmm. I mean like the windows were blown out the w the window frames were it was like shards of glass and wood harpoons flew through that room with my baby brother in there but you're asking me how I how I dealt with this as a child my mom read Psalms 91 to me all the time. But he that dwelleth in the secret place, the place. That's of the right. most high shall abide under the shadow. And this is what we have to do, those um, that are, are watching. We have to really allow God to um, infiltrate our houses. Even at this particular time that we're going through this pandemic, we need to know and allow God to move in our homes because the enemy is on attack. And he's on attack like never before because some people, they, they've lost their job. So what does that cause them to do? They don't have money to so cause some, not everybody now. So listen to me. Somebody's been to steal, to, um, to, to do whatever that's wrong to, in order to eat. So this is a, these are perilous times. Go ahead, um, um, Rebecca. Yes. So, so what was really amazing is that um, my brother did not have, when they went in to check on my brother, he was four months old. He did not have one piece of glass or wood on him. Now his crib, his crib was littered with glass and, and shards of wood. But, but see, Psalms 91 says that God will cover you with his feathers. Yes, yes. And so yes. We, we have to pray that over ourselves and over our families, over our friends, that God will cover us with his feathers, that he'll send his angels to watch over us, guard us, and protect us. And so as a little girl, I just, I just, I, I was so loved and so, um, blessed to have parents that taught me how to pray that's how we got mm -hmm. through yes. so much of what we went through was mm -hmm. praying and standing on the word of god and see my dad i was in church sunday monday i mean sunday night sunday morning sunday night wednesday and then on that weekend so i i just had the word pumped into me as a child you know and and so that's what we stand on is the word and 
because Mr. Watts would space these attacks out, we really believed every time, especially when the FBI got involved during the bombings, was yeah. that he was going to get caught. So, because a lot so of people they had to actually catch him, but you knew who it was. We knew who it was, and everybody knew who it was. Um, and then, and you know, a lot of people are like, why didn't your parents leave? You know, why would they put you as children through this kind of terrorism? But think about missionaries. Think about <laughs> missionaries that go see if people can understand missionaries going to Africa or India or China with their children. It's, 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 it's horrible situation. Sometimes they go knowing that they're going to give their life, but they were like American missionaries. <laughs> you know, they were here in America in the 70s being terrorized by this madman that attended our church and lived across the street from our house. Wow. And I'm quite sure that was just devastating for everybody. Now, um, did you have, well, I just like to ask this, um, how did these events affect your ability um, to develop healthy relationships? Because after seeing this, you would be a nervous wreck. You didn't know who to trust. It's right. Like that's right. And and my mom and dad were just very protective of us. And we knew which families, mm -hmm, we knew which families that we were aunt and uncle and that we could trust. And my mom just told me no a lot. I'd be like, can I go over to somebody's house? And she's like, no, <laughs> you know, she's mm -hmm. like, no, you can't go there. So I knew my mom was setting up safe boundaries for me as a child. Mm -hmm. And I had to respect that because there was no arguing with her anyway. You know, like I said, she was strict. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Wow. So, so you just uh, got everything from daddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I, so my dad and I just had a special bond, and I just was such a big daddy's girl, and um, just thank God for his loving kindness because you know that's the, our kids are looking to us to see if God is in us. Wow, that's true. That's true. And a lot of a lot of adults don't realize that they are um, to be teachers to their children by the way you act. But some can go to, they go to church, act one way, they mm -hmm. fully running up and down the aisle and get home and they just act crazy or belligerent. How you doing? Loretta says, oh, thank God for the teaching. Kasana um, Lemons, I see you, uh, dear. Oh, my goodness. So um, that's true. We must teach our children. And we have to not just teach them by words that we speak, but we got to teach them by example. Yeah. Especially in a day and a time like this. Because I've seen um, children, I know some of you that are teachers um, that's watching, that the, the parents, you may send a no home to his parents and say your child was doing this. And the mother come in and the father come in, they cut you out and you say, oh, I know why the child acting like that because they just like their mother and father. Right. So, what they get from home a lot of times. That's right. And I just want to add to that. Um, my mom and dad never said anything negative to me around what? me about Mr. Watts. Okay, but you no, just knew Mr. Watts was crazy. <laughs> I knew that he was the one behind it because he was right. just such a hateful man. Like, everybody was kind of scared of him. But my mom and dad, just looking back, I'm like, they really had a right to talk about him, like, in the world's view. But as a believer, as a follower of Christ, you know, um, they, they, I guess they just made it up in their mind and their hearts that they were not going to gossip about him. They were not going to slander him. So that made a big difference to me in my life, because if I had heard my dad preaching on love in the pulpit and then got home and heard him talking badly about someone, that would have made me cynical as a child. But they protected wow. me of that from that. And they also let me be a child by wow. not talking about adult problems in front of children. Girl, that's another show. <laughs> letting children get to grown folks stuff. And then the children don't know how to act when they go back in front of those same adults that the parent talked about. And I've, I've experienced it in church. Then the children come back and act, act ridiculous or disrespectful to that adult only because of what they heard the adult say, because the adult can come back. They know how to put on that fake phony smile and that fake phony attitude. And so, oh, God bless you. I <laughs> you. love you. Oh, yes. I love you. Stop. <laughs> And then the children, they acted crazy. Yeah. They actually was like, what's wrong with them? But, yes. Um, but that, that is so true. But somebody has a statement they, they made. Um, Felicia Burton, she says, um, role modeling and setting examples are vital. Role modeling and setting examples are, are vital. We agree with that. Yes. Okay. 
Somebody else has made a statement. Uh, Matthew Dennis says, we talk about the power of forgiveness in our Sunday school class. It's always a hot topic, but and we never can get away from it. And that's so true. Mm -hmm. That is true. That's true. Yeah. And I just want to add to that. Um, when we act one way in front of people and then talk about them behind their back, we're teaching our children hypocrisy. Woo, girl, you ain't never lied. <laughs> Teaching them hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Down to this. I want to hear what, what that brings. Yes. Yeah, so if you, like you were saying, if you put on a fake smile in front of somebody and then you go home and talk to them, your children are trying to figure out, like, they want to believe right. everything that mom and dad says is true, right? And so we're their filter for the world. And so if they <laughs> see us being <laughs> fake in front of people and then going home, you know, and talking about it, we're just teaching them how to be a hypocrite. We're teaching them how to be fake. And so that's... <laughs> fake, phony Christian. That's a right. Fake, phony Christian. That's what I call them. Go ahead. Yeah. And that's that. I mean, Jesus was not kind to the Pharisees. <laughs> You know, he pretty much, he almost cussed them out, <laughs> you know, if G not saying that Jesus cussed out anybody, I don't want email on that. <laughs> I know, because you'd be like, they inboxing you. But, but he, <laughs> he called them vipers. He called them snakes because yeah. they were learning about the word of God, but they were not living it. And wow. that is what is precious to the Father. That is what is precious to Jesus is to learn the word and live the word. And I just put that on my Facebook page today is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Help us live what we preach. Help us to really love people. Yes. And some people, they just with their words, with, with their heart is far from it. Listen, Lisa Shorter says evil communication corrupts good manners. That's right. And that's so true. So if you don't, I was always taught this. If you don't have nothing good to say, don't say nothing at all. That's right. You know, so I don't have nothing to say. I ain't saying it. And you especially know. in front of your kids mm -hmm. or grandkids. Important. Yes. If you want them to grow up to be great, That's you, have right. to, you have to act great in front of them. Well, so, and we, we need to be talking. We need to be praying more than we're talking anyway about that person. <laughs> Wow. Oh, see, then you're getting ready to get in trouble. I got to pray more than I talk. Oh, my God. That, Lord help that, us. Are you a pastor or a minister? We, we've been doing ministry for 25 years. Oh, 25 years. That's mm -hmm. a while. Mm -hmm. okay. In different oh, capacities, in different capacities. Um, associate pastors, oh. set up chair pastors. Uh, <laughs> the pair, clean the toilet pastors. That's right. Children's <laughs> pastors, youth pastors. <laughs> you have to go down and scrub the walls now That's with sanitizer right. pastors. <laughs> That's but um, right. it, this, this is very interesting because um, your father was a strong man from what I'm hearing. And your mom also, you know, and they had to be some praying, loving people. Because I don't know, I probably would have jetted that somebody's going to be bombing my house. <laughs> yes, I know. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense why they, you know, I got to meet Dr. Um, Aveda King last year. Oh, okay. She spoke oh, at our really? church. Yes. Okay. And, and so I gave her one of my books and I said, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I can relate to some of what your family went through with the bombings. Right. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And see, because the devil doesn't care what color we are. He's just looking to oh. implant hate in our hearts he he will mm -hmm, use mm -hmm. anyone because see this was a white man hurting a white family so it do, he doesn't care about color the devil doesn't care he will use anyone who is willing just like god will use anyone who's willing and that that is so true rebecca listen you're listening to a godly woman's view and i have the pleasure of interviewing uh, rebecca nichols alonzo all the way from tennessee by virtual network, praise God. But anyway, she's talking to us about um, her life story and what she went through in church. When we know of many of people, um, uh, uh, Rebecca has gone through church hurt and church hurt is for real. And some carry it on from childhood and now is still in adulthood and haven't forgiven. But you as a young lady, you forgave because of what your mother and father did not say to you or what they did say to you and they and they had you praying and that's that's a good thing right that's right so now did you have any outlets when you were a child to speak to anybody about what was going on in your home i 
I probably, because I was four, five, six, you know, I started kindergarten. I went to school. I was busy with church and I played just like every little kid did. And, um, and like I said, I was so loved. My mother lost a baby before she had me. And then she also okay. lost a, a baby through a, an adoption that fell apart. So by the time I was born, you know, I was just really wanted and loved. And, um, and so that love was just, it, it, it sustained me. That love sustained me through all of that. So that, like I said, they didn't talk about people in front of me in a bad way. They, they didn't talk about adult situations in front of me in a bad way. They let me be a kid. They kept me in church. We prayed together. We read the word together. I was in Sunday school class learning about the 12 disciples. I mean, I was just growing up in a very loving church community home, but right. it's that for the man that sat in pew number seven. So I mean, they're in pew number one now. Oh, I know. I get emails from pastors all the time. <laughs> they go all the way to the back of the church. So the devil be coming in there. Oh, right I know. Out of you. You know the, yeah. the devil is very bold. <laughs> yes, he is. I get those emails. Beverly Allen. Oh, my goodness. And Tanya, I believe, Farah. Farah, I might be saying it wrong, so forgive me. But um, listening to you, but let's just, just talk to those that are watching because I know that I would even, I'll ask the question um, if they're not going to ask it, but I want to know that, you know, somebody's being portrayed. How do you forgive somebody that you know that good and well, they done wronged you real bad? I mean, personally, how do you forgive this individual? Right. Well, as a child, I was just taught that that was the right thing to do. And, but I don't, I didn't know until years later how my, my dad was, was, you know, dealing with that because as the man of the house, he felt like his responsibility was to protect us. Wow. And, and, and that was really hard because a lot of nights because of these men sneaking into our yard, he would sit in a chair by the window with a gun, a rifle or shotgun across oh, his lap. No. Oh God. Trying to protect his family. And so he, he knew that if they were, on our property and he shot them, you know, that that was legal, but I'm sure he struggled with the thought of going across the street, knocking on the door and just taking care of Mr. Watts on his own. See, if we take care of things on our own, we're going to get in trouble with the law or with people. But if we fight our battle on our knees, like I watched my mom and dad do and see dad would walk around the house um, reciting scripture. He would say, I would hear my dad say, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I would hear him quoting scripture. I knew he was doing warfare. He was fighting an wow. invisible battle because Mr. Watts um, would come to church every Sunday and hear just an amazing sermon, but he would not bow his knee. That's why the Bible talks about the wheat. See, the wheat bends and surrender and the tares stand up in pride. And so wow. we want our hearts to always bend like that wheat and surrender to the Lord. Because if we stand up in our prideful opinion, we will not be able to receive the goodness that God has for us because our opinion becomes our idol. And so wow. Mr. Watts was wrapped up in his own world, in his own pride, in his own multi-million dollar, you know, um, um, lifestyle. And so he wasn't used to being told no. And this went on for five years with this terrorism. And, and then the next part, if you want me to share that part of what happened okay, after five and years. Good because um, so many don't know how to forgive. It, it, it is hard. I can't say it's not hard because it's hard to forgive if you were in a situation where someone um, uh, you are battered, were in a battered situation for they battered you emotionally, That's physically, right. Um, abused you and violated you so how in the world do I forgive you and you did all these things to me especially if I was loving you because um, Mr. Watts wasn't one that you love but we're talking about now somebody that says that love them and all of a sudden they're going to abuse them what do you say to them because they were loving this individual and this individual is supposed to love them back yes it's betrayal is is a horrible situation it's a horrible feeling it's it it goes to the depths of your heart when you love someone and then they hurt you like that and all i can say is just to take it to the lord in prayer and and find out 
turn to the back of your Bible where there's index and look up forgiveness and read every scripture you can on forgiveness because a big part of my healing came from staying in the word and looking up those scriptures on forgiveness and writing them on a piece of paper and keeping it in front of me and making a choice to forgive. Because if we wait to feel like forgiving, it's, it, <laughs> we won't do it. <laughs> we won't do it. And right. I don't know many people that wake up in the morning and feel like forgiving their abuser or forgiving their dad that left them or forgiving their grandpa that cut them out of the will. I mean, I hear everything, you know, from emails and people, pastors, church attendees all over the world of, of their pain. Because when you share your pain, people feel like they can open up and share their pain. And so all I can say is I've never found in the Bible where the word of God says, it's okay not to forgive if they cheated on you. It's okay not to forgive if they raped you. It's okay not to forgive if they neglected, abused, mistreated, lied, slandered, uh, stole from you. I cannot find that anywhere in the Bible. Like I said, if you can, no. let me know, because I've looked. So I have to go back to the word of God. It doesn't say it. It doesn't say it. There's no wiggle room. And Jesus even said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And, and, and we're talking about Jesus on the cross who has been scourged, who has been um, beaten, who has been uh, mm -hmm. whipped with a cat of nine tails and flesh torn off of him. And, and these people hate him. They've mocked him. They pulled him his beard out they've stuck thorns on his head i mean what jesus went through and for the love of in his heart to say father forgive them for they know not what they do see he was giving those people the benefit of the doubt and that's right. what the devil does not want us to do is give each other the benefit of the doubt because hurt people hurt people well that's the truth too that's why also i even say to the pastors or the fivefold ministry listen you shouldn't speak because you'll start bleeding on people. And what I mean by that, sometimes when they're hurting, because they are pastors, we hurt and we go through things, but you'll start spewing it out on the congregation. It would be like, they didn't even do anything to you. It might've been an individual, but the thing is, I don't feel as though that you should really preach under that, um, uh, uh, under that feeling, um, you know, of, um, somebody did something to me, then you start just arguing or fussing out the pulpit. That's you know, right. Bleeding on somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should um, get ourselves together and write and ask God to help us to forgive them. Um, now, there, there was a situation of a young lady I had preached at a church, and she came to me, and she was, I don't know, about 18, 20, something like that. And she said... Um, pastor she said I'd like to say something to you I said what and she started crying she says well my father went to jail and he's now dead and she said I wanted to always tell him that I forgave him for raping me mm. and he went to jail because of this and um she says what I do because she said she was so broken after hearing the message that she says I couldn't tell him that I forgave him I says well you just say it right now that I forgive my father for everything that he did to me, and that will release you. All That's right? right. That will release him, but it will help you to go further in life now because this thing was tormenting her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have heard that same kind of thing where people have had, um, I had a woman that wrote me a letter in her 70s, and she said, after I read <laughs> your book, I finally forgave my brother who was cruel to me my whole life. And wow. she said, he's dead now, so I can't tell him to his face, but I did forgive him. And I'm going to live the rest of my life out in freedom. And so right. that's why forgiveness is freedom. And that's why the enemy fights so hard to continue the lies <laughs> and the accusations, because he knows that once you forgive, even if you don't feel like it, even if they don't deserve <laughs> it, even especially if they don't deserve it. That's yes, it. they then you will get freedom. You will get that liberty that that Jesus said, I died to give you a life and what life abundantly, more, more and abundantly. that's yeah. right and I'll tell you um, I struggled with with forgiving just like everyone else does but if you read Matthew six fourteen, Jesus says if which is a conditional if you forgive those who sin against you your heavenly father will forgive you but if you yeah. refuse to forgive others your father will not forgive you of your sins Wow. So that is severe. That is, there's no wiggle room in that. We all need forgiveness. 
Now, I see somebody on from Africa. I don't know how to say your last name, but your first name is Carolyn, Pastor Carolyn. God bless you. I've listened to your um, Facebook on um, my, the Godly Woman's View, and I just, I just uh, ask anyone that wants to join it, ask me to join that group. It has 9,000 um, people in it and want you to be able to support others, and they support you in your endeavors. Now, the Bible also says, uh, Rebecca, that we're supposed to forgive 70 times 7. That's in a day. 490 times a day? Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> you know... He must not know the people we know. But <laughs> You know, you know what it is? You know what it, you know why I think Jesus gave that answer to Peter is because that's how many times that thought of accusation against that person can come in our mind a day. Yeah, true. Yeah. You know, it, it's like we're reminded every time we see that person or hear their name or think about, you know, what they've done. Yeah, we should, we should forgive. As Dennis says, Mark, he says, forgive, walk away and move on. That's the whole thing. How you doing, Leslie? Um, Washington. Um, Francine Brown, I see you. God bless you. Katie Ch uh, Chaplin, uh, Katie, God bless you. Listen, you're listening to a Godly Woman's View um, talk show with Anita C. Spaulding, and we have our guest on tonight, which is Rebecca Nichols Alonzo. And Sister Rebecca is an awesome person, and she's talking to us about betrayal and forgiveness, how a man by the name of Mr. Watts terrorized her father, which was the pastor of the church, and also the mother and the family, and um, had people, hired people to drive by and, which, and shootings and put um, little, uh, I don't know what it is, bombs in the yard and all that kind of stuff. But I asked her early, well, how do you forgive somebody who's trying to kill you? That's basically it. How do you forgive them? And she says, her parents taught them to pray. All right, to pray. And also to love <laughs> y'all hear me i said that slow to love them yeah to to pray and to love and listen so these experiences can really turn a person away from god because you're saying where is god wouldn't it oh did you ask me that yeah i said uh, some people would turn away from god but after going through some of these experiences you were going to go into the second part of what you wanted to tell us. Yes. Um, sometimes people, the hurt is, is louder than the healing and mm. they have to kind of wait and be patient with themselves um, and kind of walk. So, sometimes our healing is instant and sometimes it's a process. And so we just have to be patient with ourselves while we're being healed. And I tell people, sometimes you can forgive and you're done. You walk away, you move on. Like I, Mr. Dennis just said, um, but then other times it's a process and you have to continue to forgive out of obedience and wait for the feeling to maybe catch up later. But you step out in obedience and you say, Father, I forgive them because you have forgiven me. And then one day, like my aunt Dot, my, my dad's sister taught us, one day you'll be able to bless them. When wow. you know you can bless them, that's when yeah. you know you're totally free. If you can't bless them yet, then you're still in the process and to be working on it <laughs> and work on it. That's right. And keep giving it to the Lord, keep giving yeah. it to the Lord and know that you're not alone, that he's with you every step of the way of that process. And we have to really release them to the Lord and say, God, they're in your hands. And he does say this vengeance is mine and I will repay. So listen, his payment is going to be different from ours. That's and right. They take away from the payment of God. The scripture says, be not deceived for God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that will he also reap. So whatever a person is, is sowing, they're going to reap. Whether it, 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 whatever they do, they're going to reap it. So you don't have to worry about it, and you can just go on. But you, and I have many times asked the Lord, forgive them for what they've said or what they've done to me or how they tried to make me look. Or, mm -hmm. you know. And this is what we have to do, um, those of you that's listening. Sometimes we want to take matters into our own hands, right, Rebecca? That's right. We do something ourselves. God, just give me a minute. You just hold, you just hold your turn around, God, for a minute. I, I just, want to, just let me punch him or something. Let me do something. To him. And then God, no, my daughter, no, my son, I got this. You don't worry about it. 
I got it. I'm like, God, just please. I said, no, I have it. I said, okay, all right. But we, that's what we have to do, turn it over to the Lord. That's right. That's right. Well, and what I was just talking about, blessing them, um, that's in Romans twelve fourteen, and it's on the front of the book, and it says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Wow. And so the only way that we can do that is to step True. into the grace of God. And we sing about amazing grace and we, you know, talk about grace, but grace is not just the undeserved favor of God. Uh, grace is the ability to do something you can't do in your own strength. Mm. Grace you. is the ability to do something you can't do in your own strength. We're saved by grace because we can't save ourselves. So grace is powerful. So when we say, God, I don't want to forgive. I don't feel like forgiving. They don't deserve the forgiveness. Then if you can step back and say, but I will obey your word. And I ask you for grace to continue to forgive until I get my complete freedom. Wow. And that's what we really have to do. And we have to say and leave it into the hands of the Lord. It's so important. And this is what we don't, some people don't understand that I know that you've been um, um, misused or abused or accused. But the thing is, you be the bigger person. And sometimes I know the scripture does say this. It says to leave your gift at the altar and, and go and get it right with the person or say, not if I did anything wrong, because most of people have done something said, um, I want to apologize for whatever it is. And you might have not done anything, but you want to get it straight and get it off of you. And then it says you could go back and pick up your gift from the altar. Um, so I have another question. I have a lot of questions, but um, now, how, I guess you already answered that question. How did you survive? So what happened to Mr. Watts? That's what uh, okay. So after five years of this terrorism with the harassing phone calls, threatening um, letters, drive-by shootings, dynamite explosions, um, he found a way to get a human weapon inside our home. Um, my mom, my Jeez. mom had a friend who was married to an abusive alcoholic. And my parents had reached out to him, taken him to counseling, um, prayed with him, did all this to try to help this man. Um, and he was on uh, medication and drinking and was enraged. And so he threatened his wife and, and said, if I see you again, I'm going to kill you and their little baby boy. So she came to our house for refuge, which looking back, we were not the safest place in town. The fellow town didn't sound like it. <laughs> no, no, no. So she came to stay with us. Well, Mr. Watts found out about that. And he sent some of his guys over to um, Mr. H Mr. Williams' house with, <laughs> with uh, alcohol and lies and stirred him up and provoked him to come after his wife who was staying at our house. So he barged in to our home on Easter weekend. My dad was, it was Thursday. My dad was getting his message ready for that Easter Sunday. My mom had been working on the music, you know, with the choir and, and, and then trying to help this friend with her little baby. I'm seven. My brother had just turned three. And this husband, this enraged husband barged into our house with three guns and tons of ammunition. And my brother and I, we were just about to say the blessing with our family, we watched him shoot and kill my, my mom and shoot my dad right in front of us as children. So when you think about what we went through with Mr. Watts being horrific, this was the, this was what just oh. can push you over the ledge. This, the, not just being terrorized and being fearful, but watching a friend of the family barge into your house with guns. So I talk about that more in the book. We won't be able to talk about everything tonight. Right. You can but, purchase the book. But I, I do talk about how um, um, I was sent for help, and I start out the book, I ran. So I am seven years old. I'm sent to run for help because he took his wife and baby hostage in my bedroom for three hours. And so my, my dad, who had been <laughs> shot what oh god my dad was shot twice and one of the bullets went in his hip and it knocked him to the floor so my six foot almost six foot four dad 
ex Navy guy couldn't even defend his family, you know, because he, one of the bullets went in his hip and knocked him to the floor. Um, and you know, it was just, it was just really the mercy of God that after my mother was shot, she was able to make it to their bedroom down the hall and pass away there and not in front of me and my dad. Like I look back and see how God spared oh. us, even in the horrific shooting and killing and everything, how he was able to spare us of some of, well, I don't know that I would be able to sit here and talk about this today if my mother had died in front of me you know like I saw them be shot but but you know what I'm saying so so God you know sometimes we think things are really bad and then sometimes you know some time can pass and we can look back and go well that was bad but it could have been worse you know right let me ask you this question because that could have caused you to um hate God or to blame God because so many do when something happens in their life tra um tragically They'll say, they'll blame God, say, well, where is God? Where was God? And I don't know. And you, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. I, I know exactly what you're saying. I, I felt that way before. And I've heard people, you know, share their hearts um, with those same thoughts before. Because, you know, we say God is good. He's a good father. And then horrible and things. There is God in all That's of right. And then horrible things can still happen to us because we live in a fallen world. And I always tell people there is a purpose past your pain. There is always. Oh, you just gave me another one. There's purpose past your pain. <laughs> there is purpose if you give it to God. Yeah, that's true. He will turn your pain into a testimony. He will turn that test into a testimony. He will turn your misery into a ministry. And we've heard those things before. <laughs> but the only way that you can actually do it is if you surrender Every single, see, unresolved pain always makes its way back to God. I heard a minister say that one time. Unresolved pain always makes its way back to God. And that's why we blame God, because that pain is unresolved. Good, yes, mm -hmm. it is. And the thing is, um, Rebecca, you know, um, um, many are in pain. And I'm, pray I'm praying, and we're going to have you pray before we go off, um, that they will find their way um, to re get a release through forgiveness, but also to um, get restored. Yes. So God can use them anytime and anywhere. Now, Mr. Watts himself, because people are asking, well, what happened to Mr. Watts? Okay, well, well let me just try to get through this. Um, so after the shooting, we had to move from North Carolina to Alabama to live with my dad's family. So he lost his church. He couldn't pastor anymore. He had a nervous breakdown after losing my mom. He had already been struggling with his nerves. He could not care for me and my brother because he was heavily tranquilized um, for months. And so my dad's family and uh, his parents and one of his sisters, Dorothy, took, took care of us and helped us with a lot of recovering because it was... It, my mother was such a light in this world. She was so much fun. She was, she loved people. She laughed with you. She cried with you. She was a musician. So every time she would go to someone's house, they would always say, Ramona, play a song for us. You know, so she was an entertainer. She was a God lover. She was a lover of people. And so when my dad lost his partner in ministry, his wife, the mother of his children, it devastated him. It devastated us. My brother was three walking around the house calling, mommy, where are you? Yeah. You know, it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking when you, especially when you lose. A, I'm sorry. To actually kill you, your mother and a wife in your house. Mm -hmm. that, that's a lot. It, it was just so right. much. Yeah. So we, we flew back. Um, my, my dad and I went back a few months later once he recovered for the murder trial. And that, that man that was a friend of our family that shot my parents went to prison for life. Then a few years later, one of the FBI agents that had been brought in once the bombing started, he, um, he finally got enough evidence together to have Mr. Watts convicted by a federal grand jury and sent to prison for 15 years, which was just a slap on the hand because that was just for like the bombings and threatening letters. That didn't involve that he was the mastermind behind the shooting and the murder. Like he was never connected to that because he had the best yeah, attorneys. Um, right. He, he, had, he had a lot of money. His, his, his attorneys were state representatives. 
Okay. So, yeah. So it was, it was just so, uh, so much corruption. He was friends with the judge. The judge should have recused himself off of that case because he knew Mr. Watts and he did not do that. There was, we, we, our family were let down so many times by, um, quote, the law, justice, the court system, you know, so I can relate when people have suffered in that way as well, because you look to the law of the land for justice, right? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, we do. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but sometimes we don't get it. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes we don't get it. And it, and it, and it deepens the wound. See, whenever you go for justice and you don't get something that is already hurtful and horrible, and then you're, you know, um, just not treated fairly is, it's awful. It's awful. And I, we experienced that twice. Um, so Mr. Watts went to prison. Um, Aunt Dot, my dad's sister, when, when I was 16 and my brother was 11, ended up adopting us and raising us as a single parent. So she was taking care of her parents, and then she took care of Daniel and I, my brother Daniel. And she worked a full-time job. She came home. She cooked dinner. She took care of her elderly parents. She's taking care of a teenager, and 11-year-old. I mean, I, she, her crown is going to be huge and blinged out in heaven, let me tell you, because she... But what she, happened to your father? Because I know he got shot, too. So, so he recovered physically, but he never recovered mentally and emotionally from losing our mom. And seven years after the shooting, um, he was in a hospital being treated for his nerves, and my husband... My um, my brother and I came home from school one day, and we were told that my dad, who was only 46, uh, like I said, was in the hospital being treated for his nerves, had passed away. A blood clot, a blood clot went to his heart. And I, like I said earlier, I was a daddy's girl, and I had a good daddy. Now, I know everybody does not have a good daddy, and I, I don't, I hate that for them, but I had a good daddy, and when I lost him, because, see, I would rather have him broken than not have him at all. And so when I lost him, um, it shattered me. And, it, and, it, and I revisited this. I, I try to share this because I feel like it's important for people to hear this. If you do not deal with trauma and loss in your life, if you do not grieve in a healthy way, then when something else happens, it, you will, it's like a double grieving. It's like a double trauma if you don't know how to deal with it in a healthy way. So when my dad uh, passed away, I went into this depression for a couple of years and really fought with God and just blamed God like we were talking about. I was mad right. at God. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this is a pastor's family. Why didn't you intervene? Why didn't you save my, my mom? And why didn't you heal my dad? And just, uh, yeah, I mean, teenagers are emotional anyway, but then you add in, you know, all this trauma and loss. And, and I was just, so thank God my aunt Dot, you know, she just really dots. <laughs> yes, yes. And she, she was in the ministry. So my dad built a church and she, he handed over the church store. She pastored a church in the 70s as a female. That's so in Alabama? that was in Alabama before they yeah. came to this church. Okay. Uh-huh. And so Aunt Dot, she's, um, she's, she's just an amazing woman of God and, and just helped walk us through so much healing. So speak, uh, jumping ahead years later after um, my dad passed away and I, and I got married and we moved um, to Nashville 17 years ago, I ended up meeting some friends that helped me get this book written. And um, the book, came in front of a CNN reporter and that CNN reporter did a four day write up. And on the fourth day, the Dr. Phil um, cool. producer saw the story and called me and said, we want to do a show with you. We want you to be on, on the Dr. Phil show. And I said, well, what do you mean? She I said, well, you. I was in shock. I said, what in the world? Yes. And so she, you, so you saw it whenever it was aired. Yes. That's, that's why I was able to call you or, um, e email you to get you to come on my show and you came. Yes, it's yes. Blessing. Well, yeah. I have somebody made a comment. I want to, it says, um, Angela Lett, oh, that's another goddaughter. She says, um, I understand what she's talking about. I'm a grown woman and was asking God the same questions. Dr. Um, Jameson said, This is so good. Thank you for sharing your life story with us. Angela Lett Hawkins says, I was a daddy's girl also. She said, I write my book, Daddy's Girl, 
and um, Khadijah, uh, Amira, another goddaughter. I got like 10 godchildren, but anyway, it says amazing. But you no, know, Rebecca, we have really enjoyed um, you on tonight. And we, uh, somebody said they want a part two from you. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have Rebecca um, have the last um, words and pour into your heart. But um, we just want you to know that a godly woman's view is on every Tuesday. And we have some June highlights, some um, people that will be coming on to share their story. Winda um, Harris, uh, Carissa Lemons, uh, I don't have the paper in front of me. Uh, Felicia Burton. Uh, there's the all f I've, I've scheduled all the way out through June. I'm now working on July. So if you desire to be on a Godly Woman View talk show, all you have to do is inbox me. I'm easy to get a hold of. I, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll just be busy, but I'll get back to you. That's why I'm now getting together a staff that they'll be able to help me um, in these endeavors. Now, um, we're going to tell you the name of the book. The name of the book is The Devil in Pew Number 7. The Devil in Pew Number 7. Okay, and it's by Rebecca Nichols Alonzo. And where can you get your book, um, uh, Rebecca, Sister Rebecca? <laughs> Um, Amazon, you can get it through Amazon and then most bookstores, if they don't have it in stock, they'll order it for you. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, the, well, this is, this is really good because, um, you've blessed me. Um, because I mean, because folk do stuff to you. You don't want to, you don't feel like you've been bothered with them more. So forgive them, say, forget them, forget it. And I ain't forgiving them, but we must forgive. And, um, those things might come up, but you, you've forgiven them. You release, you go on and do what you have to do. So again, the book Reba um, says, The Devil in Pew 7 um, by Rebecca Nichols Alonzo. Now, I'm going to ask you just to, just to share with us to um, impact those that are watching because they are hurting at this time and I know that God has you on here for a reason to help somebody, all right, Rebecca? Yeah, well, I, I want to say that during that Dr. Phil experience, we were, my brother and I were face to face with the shooter, the man who shot our parents, killing our mom. And we were able to tell him in front of Dr. Phil um, and in front of the world that we forgive you, Harris. His name was Harris, well, his name is Harris Williams. And we were able to look at him and tell him with all honesty and, and truth, um, Harris, we forgive you for shooting our parents and killing our mom. And I'll, I'll tell you what, when I left that Dr. Phil studio, I felt like such a, like Victor, that, that um, yes. Revelation 12, 11 says, we overcome by what? The blood, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so those listening, I want you to know that you have a testimony that will help you overcome Everything that you've been through, there is no pain too deep. There is no pain too awful or horrible or tragic that God cannot heal and use. We overcome by the blood of the lamb. Can the enemy do anything about the blood of the lamb? No. Can he do something about the word of our testimony? Yeah, he can keep us from sharing it. And so that's where we have to step into and say, I'm not going to be silent. I'm going to share the goodness of God in the land of the living. I'm going to share how God walked me through it every step of the way. He never leaves you or forsakes you. He promises and he cannot lie. And so what we have to know is that when we forgive, we're setting ourselves free. We're setting us free. We're not going to stay in that emotional prison anymore. If I had not forgiven Mr. Watts, if I had not forgiven Harris Williams for that shooting and ruining our lives, um, by taking our parents from us, I would have been an emotional prison all those years. But because we chose to forgive, it's not for feeling like forgiveness. It's because we chose to forgive out of <laughs> obedience that, that we are set free. And I just want to say also Ephesians 4, um, Ephesians uh, 4, 31 and 32 says, get rid of all bitterness rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior, and instead be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And, and that is our instruction right there, as followers of Christ, as believers 
in Jesus that we are to get rid of bitterness, rage, and anger, and all those harsh <laughs> words, and instead we're to be kind and forgiving. See, we all want mercy, but we don't want to give it. Hey, and that's the truth. <laughs> isn't that the truth? We all want it. We all are like, God, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. And then he's like, well, what about the person that hurt you? No, no, I don't want them to have any mercy. I want you to get them. <laughs> you know, I want you to take them out or whatever. You know, it's like we don't want to extend what we need. And we need Mr. mercy. Because I, I just got a hold that a friend of yours, Ernest um, Guthrie, he says, Rebecca, so beautiful. I watched this along with Reba. I love you. Linda, uh, Kathy Fleming's watching. And um, as someone else I, I just saw. Um, but, I, you know, guys, I can't see the small writing, but I'll get to y'all later. All right. I love them. But we want you to go purchase the book. Okay, everybody purchased the book and um, they keep on. Somebody else just said, we need a part two. On, on <laughs> of it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a heavy thing. We need that. Yes, you we know? do. Yes, we do. And chapter 15 in the book. You having the last words. Uh, well, chapter 15 in the book is all about forgiveness. So things that I didn't get to talk about tonight. If you get the book and you read chapter 15, it's all about forgiveness. Okay. So we, how can they reach you? Um, yeah, you. through uh, my my email is forgiveness is freedom at gmail dot com. Forgive okay. forgiveness is freedom at gmail dot com, or Did through I Facebook. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. I have some. I got another one. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or through Facebook. Okay. Fee forgiveness is freedom at, at gmail dot com. Or you could reach her on um um. <laughs> Facebook, Facebook, all right, mm -hmm. inbox her, and you could talk to her. She's she's very good. She will talk to you. She's so pleasant and so sweet. We took about what three hour, two and a half hours trying <laughs> to get this right for Facebook to get you guys on today. And I thank God for her patience and Matthew and for Tia Wilson. These guys were so patient on Friday, trying to walk us through this Facebook to get two people on. And I thank God for them. God bless everyone, and it's certainly been nice for you to come on the show, Rebecca, and share your story. We know we'll be talking again, okay? And God bless you, and I love you. Tell your husband, Daniel, I said hello to those two beautiful children. Thank you All so right. much, Pastor. Thank you for having me. All right. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.